Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, How to Pitch Your Work in 2023. My name is Claire, and I'm from Expo North Digital. This Expo North Digital webinar is delivered through the, through the Northern Innovation Hub, designed to build on and accelerate business innovation. It is funded through the Inverness and Highland, Highland City Council Region Deal, a joint initiative supported by investment from the UK and Scottish governments, Highland Council, HIE and UHI. A warm welcome to you all. Um, just to let you know that this webinar is being recorded, um, so your webcams and your mics are automatically switched off. Um, if you've got any questions throughout the webinar, put them in the Q&A box and our host, Peter, will pick these up throughout the, throughout the webinar. Um, any technical problems or questions, if you pop them in the chat box and keep the Q&A box just for questions only, um, just so that it's easier um, for us to manage. Um, I think that's all from me now. I'll pass you over to our today's host for the webinar. Peter, over to you. Thanks so much, Claire. Uh, yeah, I'm Peter Ropeth and uh, for um, uh, the last 20 odd years I've been Expo North uh, and its predecessors writing and publishing sector advisor and um, for the last kind of eight or nine of those years we've been running a tweet pitch, a pitch event on Twitter and in more recent years we've also added to that this pre-tweet pitch event which provides an opportunity really for us to kind of focus on what's the trends in publishing, what kind of year it's been, what uh, publishers and agents are looking for and also very importantly how to pitch your work in 2023 and these things do change every year we do this and these things change quite a bit the way in which the industry works changes the types of things that the agents and publishers are looking for changes as well so I think this has become a really valuable part of our program in terms of keeping us and everyone up to date writers up to date in Scotland about really what, what what the agents in the industry is looking for. Now, um, I'm delighted to welcome today um, to our, our screens, Jenny Brown of the Jenny Brown um, uh, Agency, um, and Carol Clark and Louise Lamont, who are now all of the speakers are going to introduce themselves. Uh, they're all agents and representing quite different things as well. So very excited to bring that kind of new perspective and to welcome um, some new agents to our screens as well, which is, which is great. And uh, so how we're going to do this is for the first part of the session, I'm going to hand over to the agents individually. They're going to introduce themselves and their agencies and their work and also pick out a highlight or two for themselves from their work and perhaps from across the whole uh, of, of publishing in the last year. Uh, then we're going to have um, a section on the mechanics of the tweet pitch itself um you know how that actually works what you have to do to participate um and then the final part of the session will be um we'll go into the do's and don'ts of pitching work both for tweet pitch but also generally most of the, what we say today will actually be for general use just to, if you're approaching a publishing or an agent in a much more you know uh, sort of the more traditional ways than uh, 271 characters on on twitter um so and then at the end we'll have a little bit of time for for uh, q a so do as claire said put your questions into the q a box and um, i'll pick them up from there and uh, we'll find them to our to our speakers so it's my great pleasure to to welcome uh, uh the to this today and um i'll start with jenny brown Thank you. Thank you very much, Pete. Happy New Year, everybody. And thanks very much for, for joining us for this webinar. Um, I'd just like to introduce, first of all, Jenny Brown Associates, which I started almost 21 years ago as a Scottish-based agency. I was very aware that there are lots of terrific agents in London, but that for some writers, they'd much prefer to be closer to their agents. And I felt that I could be the one going to London, going to Frankfurt, going to other book fairs. And, and so with the sort of words from the National Museum of Scotland, Scotland the world was very much my motto when I started out. And um, even now, almost all of my writers are Scottish based. They don't have to be Scottish. They don't have to be writing about Scotland, but I like to meet up with them regularly. 
Um, and I'm now joined by three others in the agency, Lucy Dukes, who looks after children and young adult work, and she also um, represents illustrators as well as writers. And Lisa Highton joined us just last year. She was a publisher before. She is actually London based, so she doesn't have this sort of Scotland, quite such a Scottish focused list, but she loves being in Scotland. And we've also got Andrea Joyce, um, who is our rights director. So she is taking the work that has been published here and selling it internationally to America to in translation to European languages, etc. So that's the four of us. And um, I thought I would just do a little bit of show and tell if that's okay, just by holding up various books. And I wanted to start with this one. It's in Dutch. And the reason I'm showing this one, it's uh, in English, it's called The Ponies at the Edge of the World. And it's by a writer called Catherine Monroe. Uh, and it's a nonfiction book. Catherine pitched to us during Expo North's tweet pitch five years ago. And she pitched this book and she just had very little, a, an idea that she wanted to write about ponies and how well they're suited to Shetland and the other breeds in Shetland and how landscape people and animals have come together in, in that place. And uh, having seen her, her pitch, I was in touch with her. It took her quite a long time to write the book. And of course, the whole publishing um, exercise takes quite a long time as well. So it only came out in 2022 with Ebury. And actually, there was a lovely segment filmed by the One Show, BBC One's One Show, which went to Shetland as the book came out. And how wonderful also to have it in, uh, in Dutch as well. Um, so I suppose that introduces one of my great interests, which is uh, both memoir and nature writing. And I represent a number of writers in this, in this field, like Kathleen Jamie, obviously with her amazing essays. And another book that came out last year is Malachi Talek's Illuminated by Water. And this is a book about his passion for, for fishing, but it's also about a passion for place, for being still in nature. So it's got that memoir nature thread running through it, which I, I, I really respond to. This came out with Doubleday um, in July and will be out in, this is just the proof, out in paperback um, this year. Can I go on, Pete, is that okay? Um, uh, another one I wanted just to say th that you never know, as an agent, you never know what's going to cross your desk and what what a writer's passion is going to really enthuse you as the agent and what you hope is also going to enthuse the publisher and readers as well. And this book by Sandy Winterbottom, The Two-Headed Whale, um, came to me as a proposal in late 2021 and was published by Berlin just in October. And Sandy, having been a geologist, took a voyage to Antarctica a few years ago on a tall ship for six weeks. And when she was there, she discovered the grave in South Georgia of a young boy from Leith in Edinburgh who died in the early 1950s. He was only 17. And she thought what, 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 what led, what circumstances led to his death. And she went out to discover it. So the book is, she's recreated his last journey and it's about whaling, it's about Scotland's blood on our hands as the whaling industry uh, progressed in the, in the 19th and 20th centuries. And this young boy was a whaler. A, a really extraordinary book, a mixture of travel, memoir, nature, climate emergency. Um, and I'm getting so many emails from readers who have just come across it uh, and I've been really moved by it. So that kind of book, you know, I, could, I couldn't have sat down and say, this is what I'm looking for. But when it comes across your desk, and I'm sure Caro and Louise would agree, you you uh, it, it it kind of turns everything around. Um, one more, one more nonfiction, Homelands by Chitra Ramaswamy, absolutely astonishing book, a remarkable account of a friendship between Chitra, who's in her forties, uh, from um, parents who came as immigrants into London and from South Asia, from India, and her friendship with Henry Wooger, 
who came over with kinder transport in the 1930s into Scotland. And it's about their friendship. It's about finding home and what home means. And it won the Saltire Nonfiction Book of the Year just last month, which was wonderful. So as you can tell, I love nonfiction. I, I would really hope during this Expo North exercise that I will find more really interesting narrative nonfiction. But I also love reading fiction. Pete, can I go on? Please do. Okay. Uh, Sarah Sheridan's The Fair Botanists. This was just a joy of a novel to work with Sarah and the publishers Hodder on. Um, it is set in 1820s. It's a, set in Edinburgh. It's, uh, it's about the moving of the Britannic Gardens from its old position up to um, the present position in Inverleith. It's about perfume. It, um, it's about Walter Scott. It's about so many other things, but it's about also a plant that only flowers maybe once every number of decades and it's about to flower and certain people in Edinburgh have got their own reasons for wanting to get their hands on that flower that as it as it as it comes into bloom um and it just resonated with readers this book and we we're really pleased because it became Waterson's Scottish Book of the Year um and everywhere I go I find people who have read it uh, so that's uh just a, a, a sort of little glimpse of the historical fiction from and fiction and non-fiction of last year. But this is the one I'm really excited about telling you for 2023, Sally Magnuson's third novel, Music in the Dark. It's set um, in the 19th century, and it's about a woman who has survived the Highland Clearances. And one of the most disgraceful episodes in the Clearances has come out damaged and has had to live her life damaged by what happened um, when she was cleared off the land. And it's about it's a novel about second chances. I can't recommend it highly enough. You'll have to wait till May. OK, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> hey, thanks so much, Jenny. Some great pics and lovely covers as well on those. Um, so um, next, I'd like to come to you, Louise. And of course, welcome to uh, the Silver Screen of Expo North. Thank you very much. Very lovely to be here. Thank you. Um, so yes, my name is Louise and I work for an agency called Luigi Bonomi Associates, which is based in London. But a few years ago, before the pandemic, uh, anticipating how things were going to go, um, I moved up here um, because I'm Scottish and uh, I had always wanted to come back and work and live in Scotland. And it seemed to me that it was perfectly possible to do all of the work that had always seemed so London centric, but actually there's no reason at all that you need to be in London um, in order to um, be an effective uh, agent. So that was the case that I made uh, to my colleagues and uh, perhaps because they were sick of me eating all of their snacks every time I got a bit hungry in the afternoon, they were more than happy to send me away. Um, and it's it's been uh, a joy and delight ever since. Um, I represent pretty much anything, but um, in particular, I have a, a, um, a, a taste for children's and YA or teen. And I think because I'm sort of unique in that in this um, in this panel, I'm going to sort of focus particularly on kind of what's been happening in children's and uh, YA over the last year, um, because it's actually been a really extraordinary and exciting time for uh, this area of publishing. Um, I, I'm sure uh, book talk is uh, perhaps something that uh, uh, you may have heard about and the impact that it's been having on readers and reading. It has just kind of opened up this extraordinary untapped kind of appetite for um, for novels that has uh, we've particularly sort of seen coming particularly strongly through uh, teen uh, readers, um, which has been really exciting. In particular, I think it has impacted two kinds of book, um, rom-coms and books that would fall under kind of dark academia, kind of which is um, a, a sort of catch-all term for sort of a, a kind of fantasy, a kind of dark twisted crime set in some a world that's kind of cloistered and a little bit tweedy and shrouded in secrecy and sort of 
university boarding school sort of that kind of realm um I think those are the two sort of real um sort of areas of growth that we've seen um which has been hugely exciting the sort of pinnacles of those have been books like Babel and um the Atlas Six uh, which sort of stormed through last year I think we'll continue to see books like that um finding a really responsive readership um and on the kind of romantic comedy side I think that's where for understandable reasons everyone's looking for a little bit of comfort a little bit of joy in their reading and a little bit of escapism um so you you know whenever you walk into a waterstones you will see inevitably a table that is awash with kind of beautiful pastel colored um covers that uh, are kind of the rom-com uh, titles of du jour um but on the ya side in particular the book that i'd pick out is um heartstopper which actually wasn't published last year, but um, but had a TV adaptation come out on Netflix, which has had the most extraordinary impact in in the last year on kind of the backlist. Uh, and Heartstopper is everything that we were told a few years ago by publishers that um, UK YA couldn't do. Um, it's very small. It's very quiet. It's um, a set of stories about uh, a a group of really likable, lovely, normal teens and their friendships and um, their sort of, you know, first experiences of love and kisses and crushes. Um, it's so beautifully observed, so delicate, so funny, so sweet, but quiet. And that has always been a real struggle in the UK YA market to kind of make space for that. Heartstopper has really opened that up for us and it's really exciting to sort of see publishers and retailers respond. So to me, that's kind of what has really been sort of happening in um, in children's and YA over the last uh, year. Um, I would also just add on the children's side more than YA, um, there's always been a real drive for funny fiction. But I think that in adding to that in the last year particularly is uh, the need for stories that are short and punchy. And I think part of the reasoning behind that um, is that over the last few years we've really noticed that um, young readers have emerged from kind of the pandemic in two three years of really disrupted schooling uh, with uh, an appetite for really sophisticated storytelling but they don't have the literacy levels that they would have had at that age a few years before and also much like everybody else they don't have the concentration spans that, that they used to have. So texts that are short to the point, don't waffle around, aren't too daunting, um, are really sort of cracking through at the moment. So that's an overview, I would say, of kind of children's and YA at the moment. And um, Louise, that's very, very interesting. And also, just in terms of what you know, your kind of highlights of the last year. I mean, uh, what what yourself have you liked picking up and seeing out there, and maybe even beyond that, you know, other 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 people's work. What what's been your 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 highlight over the last you know twelve months or so? Well, on my own list, um, the uh, one book that has just come out in the last week, which um, was a real thrill to be working on over the whole of last year, um, is Laura Wood's YA, historical YA, The Agency for Scandal, which we pitched um, as Bridgerton meets Charlie's Angels. It's set in Victorian London. Love it. It's about <laughs> Good, good. <laughs> um, it's about a secret agency of young women who uh, sort of, infiltrate society and right all the wrongs uh, on behalf of other women in a, in a society that is sort of set completely against them. Um, and in particular, it's about a young woman called Izzy who uh, has to um, uh, embark upon a, a very dangerous mission, unfortunately, with the handsome Duke that she's had an unrequited crush on for a good while. Um, and all kinds of hijinks ensue. It's just the most glorious, in like, heavenly sort of cushion of a book to sink into um it came out last week it has a beautiful cover beautiful package i cannot recommend it enough for any time of year but particularly january um so do rush off and and uh and and indulge yourself with that um and um beyond that sort of out, outside of my own list i think one of the books that i took real heart from seeing how um 
how successful it was last year was a an adult novel called Tomorrow, Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle, Gabrielle Sivin, uh, which is an American, um, yeah, <laughs> an American novel, um, not a debut. Um, I'm not sure how many books she'd published before, but this is the one that has kind of really cut through, which is also always really sort of heartening to see a sort of um, a midless success, sort of changing everything before. Um, but it was a really thoughtful um, uh, story about uh, a group of friends who embark on a career together uh, designing video games. And um, it's quite a uh, quite a soap opery story. Um, you just get really sort of drawn into this this trio of difficult characters and how they rub up against each other and um, challenge each other and fall in love and fall out of love and what what the love between them all means. Um, but I thought it was also a really um, rare and refreshing look at video games and kind of the place that they have in the fabric of um, of our lives and that sort of sometimes gets lost in in the book world they're not really sort of given the same status as kind of music or film or television um, and so I, I thought that was really refreshing but I think the fact that something so unusual and something that might otherwise have just been buried on an author's mid list had just stormed through and resonated I think is just an indication that that publishing is at a really in a really healthy place unexpectedly. <laughs> Thanks very much. And of course, um, yeah, all, all potential tweet pictures, take note of that tagline. They're, they're gold dust when you get them as, as, uh, as strong as that. Um, so, uh, Carol, again, yes, welcome hello. To uh, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, and thank you for having me. I'm actually a very new agent, so I only uh, launched my agency last year, so I have very few highlights. Uh, but I, um, I've worked in publishing for the past 12 years, first at Transworld and then at Cangate Books in uh, Scotland, and I also co-founded the Nan Shepherd Prize for underrepresented nature writers. Uh, so I'm currently building my list um and one of my uh highlight which is very much the only one that i can mention because in publishing deals get announced um uh sometimes it takes years for them to be announced um but i my my very first deal as an agent is to sell polly a uh, atkins memoir um of nature rating and disability and chronic illness uh to scepter to an editor uh at hachette based in scotland which is really lovely uh when that happens uh and so this will be coming out in july next year and it's just a really beautiful book um, and also one of my authors, Andres and Orderica, was shortlisted for the Soul Tire Poetry Prize uh, for his debut poetry collection, At least, at least This I Know, uh, which was a really uh, beautiful book. Um, and in terms of the books that I represent, I don't do children's books, but I represent uh, adult fiction and nonfiction. I have very broad tastes, so it goes from literary and experimental fiction to commercial and genre. Um, and then I also do narrative um, and serious nonfiction. And like Jenny, I love nature writing. So uh, anything to do with nature, um, I adore as well. And uh, food writing. And I'm especially looking for uh, underrepresented voices. Um, and in terms of uh, sort of industry highlight, uh, I absolutely uh, adore the fact that uh, um, Novel in verse written in Orcadian dialect won the Arthur C. Clarke um, from the amazing Harry Josephine Giles. Um, and so that was a uh, really wonderful news. Um, and uh, in terms of, you know, books that editors are looking for at the moment or which seem to be the new trend, definitely rom-coms um, are uh, really the, the books that are coming. Sorry, my cat has just entered. Um, and um, also Cozy Crime is doing really well. Obviously, um, um, what's his name? Of course, I've forgotten. Richard his Osman. There we go. Uh, Richard Osman um, is doing really well, but books like The Appeal, um, are also uh, doing incredibly well. So I think that's really a, a genre that's here to, to stay. Um, and yeah, I think that's it um, on my end. Can I just add, of course, that your agency is the fabulously known Portobello. Yes, which is where I live. 
<laughs> very imaginative. Uh, yeah. No, no, very good, a very good name, good name to have, and a great, uh, a great part of the city, or is it a place of its own, not in the city, but very no, it literally. All the... it, it, it used to be separate from Edinburgh, but now it is uh, part of Edinburgh, and we have a gorgeous bookshop. Uh, if you haven't been there, you you really should. It's a delight. Yeah. Can I just ask you as well? This is. I think uh, myself and many others would take great um, heart from the fact that we're seeing agencies like your own starting up at this time, you know, I mean, we're constantly kind of given, um, you know, kind of doom laden messages about the difficulties of publishing. They're always there. It is difficult to get published and the, the problems that publishers face as well, you know, but it's, I think it's very um, encouraging that here we are, you know, there's uh, new agents and there's a new agency in in Scotland. And yeah, I, I think and, it, and know, represents also, the... Yeah, there's also the underlying uh, literary agency with Ruby Geary, uh, the literary office with Jenny Todd. Um, I think we're up to 15 members of the Association of Scottish Literary Agents, which is fantastic. Um, and the North Agency, there are two agents um, there that are based in Scotland. Um, so it, it's really heartening that um, new agencies are popping up in Scotland, but also people who worked uh, on in London are moving out. Um, so quite a few people are doing that as well, which is very nice to for things to get a bit more decentralised. And I think, yeah. to that, sorry, if I can add to that as well. Um, Caro mentioned Portobello Bookshop. I think one of the other really heartening things that we've seen over the last um, few years is a real flourishing in the independent bookshop um, sector. There, I mean, Edinburgh is incredibly well served for uh, independent bookshops, and it would be lovely to see more elsewhere as well. Um, but I think keeping the ecosystem of how books find customers um, is is really crucial, and um, it can't all depend on. Waterstones and, and Amazon. So um, I've been really cheered to see the health of, of independent bookshops coming through over the last two years too. And it's wonderful to see uh, bookshops like Ullapool Bookshop and the Highland Bookshop in Fort William, um, also the Cayley Place in Ullapool, to have really strong showings in the north as well as in the central belt for bookshops. So long may that continue. And of course, long may we support them with our, with our custom. Indeed. So uh, just to, to move on a little bit and to kind of cut straight back to the other end of that process, the thing that might see your book uh, and you appear in one of these uh, bookshops and their fabulous live events as well. Um, the tweet pitch, um, this has been going now for sort of eight or nine years and, uh, and over the years the mechanics of it have changed. I just wanted to say one or two things about that. Um, the tweet pitch is running on Friday the 20th of January this year, um, generally from 9 till 9, we kind of pitch it, so it's a 12 hour window, um, but I know as well that some people do actually go back over the over the tweet pitches and the pitches that are made that day. Um, for writers, it's basically, um, and this is one of the things that has changed, of course, when we started this, it was much more difficult, it was 140 characters that you had, minus the hashtag, and we used to have a lot more hashtags, so I think the lowest that have been available was something like 125 or something characters. We now have the luxury of 271, because you can make your pitch, but you've got to include the hashtag Expo North, which is X-P-O-N-O-R-T-H. And that's the thing that enables the agents and publishers that are tuning into this day to actually see your pitch. If that hashtag isn't there, they can't see it. Um, or they're not, you know, they're not gonna look around, they don't know you're doing it. This is the only way that you can alert um, you know, our, our agents and publishers to the fact that you are pitching on that day. We don't use it in any other way on that day. So everything that happens at that time is is a is a tweet pitch. Now, what hasn't changed is the breadth of what we are actually open for, which is adult and children's fiction and non-fiction. Um, we've always been as inclusive, really, because I know things do arise where people say, "Well, what about this and what about that?" Well, the answer is I would encourage anyone, really, with any project that they think is, um, you know, good work that's unpublished, that's at the right stage for them to have 
you know, a follow up and to be able to respond to that in a reasonable period of time to actually to actually, you know, make a, a, a pitch so that you put that work in there. Um, and, um, you know, you've got to be in it to win it, basically. So um, I'd encourage anyone not to be too put off by kind of what are the rules for this? What are the rules of that? You know, to, to get that work in there. So long as it's not published, um, um, you know, there are, of course, other, you know, there are other, other caveats to that. But we do run with that. It's going to be unpublished, unpublished work. Um, then, then we would welcome it. Um, I think other things to say are that we also welcome, you can pitch the same work more than once, but I would say that uh, what you've got to do in that case is not constantly repeat the same thing. That doesn't work. If anything, it's a little bit of a turnoff. There's a, a lot of interaction and people don't want to keep seeing the same thing. Um, don't keep wanting to run into that. So if you're going to pitch the same work more than once, um, use that opportunity to find different aspects of that work or a different approach to it that you think might be appealing to an agent or a publisher and do a different do a different tweet. Don't just put it, you know, a character for character facsimile of the first one you did in the day and keep repeating that on the hour over the day. That doesn't add to the appeal of the work and it doesn't make it more visible. Our agents will and publishers will see the, the work and they will respond. Um, so I, I just say that and I'd just so, so I'd like to come to Jenny. So in addition to the sort of things that I've mentioned there. What would you say were the things that people have to bear in mind in terms of the mechanics of this? Well, I think bear in mind that um, whoever is following uh, the Twitter pitch, and thousands of people do, there's a heck of a lot of information. So if you're pitching your work, you might, uh, and, and even if you're having a number of different tweets to pitch it, you might think about pinning on your Twitter feed you know, your best tweet, your best pitch to that so that anybody who's interested, who looks uh, either at the time or maybe, you know, as, as Pete says, you know, some some agents and editors don't manage to follow all the, the pitches on the day, but they might do over the weekend so they can go straight to it. Um, sorry, jumping around a bit on advice. It's not for everybody. This this. Pitching is not for everybody. And a lot of people would much rather do the conventional uh, pitch, uh, conventional submission to agents and publishers um, on an email or even on paper, even hard copies. But I would say that you can learn a huge amount, even if you don't take part. So say you've got, you want to start querying your novel or your nonfiction. I would say, follow the hashtag during the day, day see how people are pitching. Um, because th there's a lot to learn uh, about. And you can see where people go wrong sometimes, and it doesn't sound as attractive a proposition as, uh, as it might do if it was pitched slightly differently. So um, that was a, would be another thing I would say. Know what your work is about. What is, what is your book about? This is getting to the heart of it. Your tweet should be able to absolutely encapsulate what it is and have some, some kind of emotional pull that makes people think, ah, oh, right, I can see the potential in that. OK, it's just a tiny snapshot of it, but it is somehow encapsulating the, the, the nugget of it. So um, we've, oh, Peter, over the years, we've had a lot of different questions about yeah. whether you should have include the title in and use some of that, those 280 characters for the title. I would say not necessary, um, uh, but what we want to know is, you know, what is, you know, if it's a crime novel, who is it? What's in jeopardy? Um, where's that, you know, give us an idea there is a twist. Give us an idea of the setting, because um, as Caro says, lots of interest in, in, in um, cosy crime at the moment, but the market's already getting quite uh, crowded what's distinctive about your your one what is the maverick um protagonist uh that we want we all want to read about it's that kind of uh information that should go in there i'll, I'll uh, come to the issue of pitching for children when we talk more generally about um pitching work if I, if I may and why things as well um just a couple of, of questions 
um, which I'll take now as we're on this kind of thing of the mechanics. One that occurred that was said to be prior to um, this event, someone who, who may, may not have been able to other, but I think it's a, a valid point is, what about um, people who are wanting to get their plays published, drama? Um, how do we feel about that? I mean, my own, my own response is immediately, yeah, go for it. You know, but with the but with the expectation of knowing that our panel is a you know is a general trade group rather than a specialist publisher, but you never know. You know, it's all about how you communicate that and what your what your story is. I think, and so I'd never say no to to something like that. You know, um, you know, I don't, I don't know how I how um, the rest of the panel feel about that. Um, we don't have any specialist uh, stage uh, agents um, in Scotland, and I don't think oh, are this is there any are there any publishers who would publish plays? Um, Bloomsbury um, have mm -hmm. recently acquired Oberon Books um, that publish plays. Oh yes, yeah, um, and you'll have a few. Just um, always the the way to do it is go in a bookshop or online and look who the publishers of plays that you know um are and then contact them uh it's usually um a good way to figure out who does that and i would think the writers and artists uh handbook would have uh, a section on plays um that can tell you which agents are looking to represent um plays yeah i, I but i would say that i think it's quite a different discipline i've done a couple of um uh, publishing deals for plays but they're plays that have already been produced um, and have had a life and that has gone through um, a drama agent and I just happen to have handled kind of the literary side of it um, I, I don't know that we would be the necessarily the first port of call for someone um, with an unproduced play um, I think it would be difficult to get that published um, uh, cold um, and I think they would probably be better off looking for uh, a drama agent in the first instance mm. but that that people's experience may, may vary so with those caveats that's the you know that's the thing i personally would say i think there's a lot of merit uh, particularly as jenny was saying about knowing your work and understanding your work this is a very good exercise and i'd encourage all writers to sort of practice this before the day think about your book what, what you've got what you want to do what you want to put out there and produce different versions of it work it because it it's such a good process for you to understand your work and the development of your work anyway and this gives you a chance to do that to actually put it out there and say well that actually is what i can say in two sentences about my book and i think that's hugely beneficial uh, as a process in terms of the relationship between you and your work anyway so with those caveats about um, drama and stage work, by all means do participate, but be aware that it is not a specialist um, group of agents or publishers for that for that sector. So yeah, and um, be aware that we might say, "Oh, that sounds fantastic! Please write it as a novel." <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so another couple of questions here. Um, just one to one, which I think is really really important, and this is definitely something that we will, we will be looking at more and more as well from Marcus, um, which is about the inclusion of Gallic um, books, you know. Now, again, I'm going to say that absolutely we will welcome this, but you've got to be aware that, 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 that some of the publishers who are present do have an interest in publishing Gallic, some don't. This is a, a panels of general trade publishing. Um, um, Having said that, I think it's really important that the Gallic writers feel that this is for them, and we certainly are working on the on the um, on the basis of encouraging anyone who works in in Gallic to participate in this, and we're very much um, very much welcome that and get entirely the points that people might want to make about that and, and its place. That said, this is about the the, the 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 trade in terms of our publishers and our agents, so that is who you're pitching to. And it's always important, whatever you're doing, to be aware of that um, scenario, because it also controls expectation. You know, I mean, you see a lot of things online about him sort of writing social media groups where people, you know, 
so oh i've had rejection after rejection after rejection and i often will bet my bottom dollar to say well a lot of those or a good number of those might actually be made up of people because you've sent it to the wrong people without doing the research and without kind of knowing the market sufficiently you want to cut that out because it's depressing anyway you know no one wants a, a pile of things if you're going to get rejections make sure it's for all the right reasons and not the right and not the wrong ones you know so always know your work and always know the market and where we're working is in the general trade you know but i think it's important that gaelic is there and we do have publishers in scotland who are you know solely gaelic publishers but also ones who are um or, or gaelic first as you say but also ones who are um you know have a, have a have a list of gaelic books um so i would very much wish to encourage that and um would, would want to make publishers and agents of those works to feel that they were also welcome to to um to, to have a look at this and to participate um, Something which happened uh, has been happening increasingly over the last few years, Pete, is that uh, publishers and agents in the days before the tweet, tweet, uh, tweet pitch have been actually saying, I'm taking part and actually I'm, what I'm hoping to find is, you know, whatever. And I think that can be, you know, that's really good. And perhaps somebody who may not have been thinking about pitching might pitch as a result of that of hearing what they're looking for, what memoir, unusual memoirs or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great, you know. Um, so another question there, uh, is there a benefit when pitching to using hashtag to identify the genre um, as well as the actual by North ha hashtag, e.g. hashtag middle grade, e.g. children's fiction? Um, I don't think it has to be a hashtag, and um, I imagine that you would probably be able to convey the genre um, through the rest of the pitch without stating it. Um, it. It will probably become quite clear that this is romance, or this is about a five-year-old or an eight-year-old boy discovering he's a superhero, which means it's probably middle grade. Um, so I think in the interests of keeping your um, character count down and being able to use every character to tell as much of the flavor of the story as possible i i wouldn't personally bother with with a hashtag for the genre okay okay thanks um just one other thing before we move on we will come back to the questions which is about should we only pitch completed manuscripts there's a couple of questions here about that um what are your thoughts on that I don't think it has to be complete or for, certainly for nonfiction, um, we would only expect um, a writer to be submitting a proposal and there might be a sample text. Um, and I've given this example in previous years, but when you could only pitch for 140 characters at the very start of the, uh, of the New Year tweet pitch, a, a writer called Esther Rutter just pitched a golden fleece, this golden fleece, a very British history of wool. And I immediately got in touch with her and said, oh, that sounds great. And in fact, she hadn't written a word, <laughs> but she had the idea and she also had the experience of why she was the best person to write this, this narrative nonfiction. And by uh, London Book Fair, we had a proposal and sample chapters and we actually had an auction for it at London Book Fair, which was just three months after the tweet pitch. That's quite, a kind of a quite extreme version of whether you should <laughs> finished it or not. Um, I would say that sometimes in the past, I have got in touch with a fiction writer and say, this sounds fantastic, please let me read it. And then discovered actually they have, maybe they've only got a couple of chapters. I mean, that's fine, but this allows you to start a dialogue between agent or editor and writer. And you may not have it already um, and finished, but you can stimulate interest and you can continue to have that dialogue. And, you know, as I did with Catherine Monroe with the ponies from the edge of the world, which may not be ready for another two, two years or whatever, but you've started that, that process. So I don't know what you th both think, Caro and Louise, but I would say it's not necessary to have finished it. No, it's not necessary. And I think, um, I think the only caveat for fiction is that, you know, when we say when you, you your pitch will be most successful if you know what the story is. Mm -hmm. uh, so while you may not have written it, you should know enough about the story that you have a whole book ready 
um if that makes sense you know that that you, you know what genre it is you know what happens uh, but not necessarily finish it because obviously if your pitch is a certain way but you haven't even worked out uh the bulk of the plot uh is probably not going to be the same book by the end of it which is fine um but you may you may want to know what that book is um and I think I would just add um, that I think pitching in this scenario is different to submitting to agents through normal channels. And when you are submitting to agents um, through normal channels, um, you should have a finished manuscript for fiction, um, not just a finished manuscript, but a revised and edited uh, manuscript when you're submitting uh, to us. But for the purposes of this um, event, when you're pitching, as Jenny said, it's a good opportunity to kind of spark off that connection, see what's working. Um, and for that, you don't you don't need a finished manuscript. Just uh, moving on, thanks, uh, Louise. Um, I'll stay with you if I can, just to sort of move on to a more general sphere than about, about pitching of work. What, um, for you, from your perspective, does a kind of good pitch of children's work and YA and so forth look like today? What does an agent are you looking for that kind of works for you in terms of the makeup of a of a pitch? What are the elements of that, and what what's the tone of it, and what's the kind of feel of it? You know. Well, I think um, uh, I realised with some horror that my word of twenty twenty two was vibes, and I realised that I was using it all the time to describe sort of what I wanted. But actually, it's very it's very useful here in terms of kind of tone and flavour, which are two things that we've already sort of talked about with with pitching. Um, I think for um, a good pitch, there are the core elements which will apply in almost any kind of pitch, which is introducing a main character um, that we're going to engage with, giving us a sense of what they want, or what they need out of the story, um, and giving us a sense of what is, I won't put my middle thing up there then, um, what um, it is that's going to stand in their way, or what has shaken up their world and made things difficult for them, what, what, is going to sort of be the propulsion in that quest. So those are kind of the core elements, but you also need to convey a sense of the flavor of the story, be that the setting, the tone, um, whether it's you know deadly serious, whether it's light and funny and um uh and and cozy. Um, and that I think is one of the aspects that's quite difficult to get in a very distilled one or two line pitch. Um, but if you can do it, it really it just makes me all the more excited to sort of read it. Um, if someone has been on a blurb workshop with me, they'll already know what I'm about to read out. But if you haven't, then enjoy the surprise. Um, but this is a, you know, a, a very effective uh, one line pitch for a very well known story. Um, so for the core elements, they're all there. But there's one aspect that's completely wrong once you realize which story it's for. So I'm going to read it out um, and then explain. So the, the, the pitch is um, a young girl arrives in a new world, kills the first person she meets and then teams up with three strangers to kill again. So that's very clear. You know who the main character is. You know what's kind of changed in her world. You know what she's setting out to do. Um, but the story that it's describing is The Wizard of Oz. I don't think anyone <laughs> would say that that was an accurate uh, description of the experience of the story that you're getting in The Wizard of Oz. So, you know, I think that's a, a sort of extreme example of looking at how you bring in the right tone and the right flavour to those core elements. The other aspect that um, I see quite a lot in pitching for children's and YA, and we touched on it very briefly at the very beginning, was um, uh, comp titles or comp, comp authors. So kind of points of comparison, uh, you know, I said Bridgerton meets uh, Charlie's Angels for the agency for scandal. Um, what I see quite often are uh, comps that indicate to me that possibly the author hasn't read any children's books in the last 20 years. So they'll say kind of, you know, for fans of, Roald Dahl and Enid Blyton or for fans of Harry Potter or there'll be you know there'll be such kind of big vague big brand um, comps that they don't really tell me very much about your particular story and its likely place in the market now 
And I think it's always good to get a sense from a, uh, an author's overall pitch that they do read um, children's fiction now, kind of what's working in contemporary children's fiction, and that they're not sort of, they're not writing or pegging their books to things that they read when they were kids 20, 30, 40 years before. So if you're using a comp, uh, be it a title or an author, see if you can get a comp that is from the last few years, um, because that's where publishers are going to be thinking about, you know, where does this book sit in retail now? Um, and uh, and how are we going to be pitching this to kind of the Waterstones buyer who just bought this book and the Amazon buyer who just bought this book? And I thought so I, I would add onto comps for adult as well um, in that, um, you know, you, you should really use something that is quite successful and recognizable. Um, and you can use either uh, one or two. And when you use a combination, they should be quite different. Um, so if you use, if you want a police procedural and you're saying, it's uh, Miss Marple meets Angela Fletcher. They kind of do the same thing. I'm just saying that because of Louise's mug. Uh, <laughs> um, these are quite similar and they don't give you anything. Uh, but obviously the one that Louise mentioned is really striking. But if you want something quite striking, you could do something like... Um, Dairy Girls meets Game of Thrones and immediately I mean I want to read that book please if you're writing it but um you know like these are the type of unexpected pairing where people are like oh that's interesting and so this is you know what um you know using Harry Potter meets Twilight would never happen but you you know using very bland in a way or very widespread um very commonly used comps doesn't quite work in your favor to stand out. That's right. Do you remember how uh, Puffin uh, pitched Artemis Fowl when it came out? And the tagline was, die hard, but with fairies. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think that's also a really good point is that, I mean, particularly in the children's and YA front, you can draw your comps, not just from the world of books. They can be from film and television, music, mm. video games. Um, you know, pop culture in general, um, you know, you can you can bring those points of influence in there um, because they're all part of the common currency of what we're drawing on. And do you think it's important as well to kind of locate your work in relation to particular authors? So not just kind of these sorts of tags, you know, that give up the vibe or the feel of something, but do you play, would you say that people need to place their work actually like on the bookshelf? with their, you know, their the, the writers to whom the, the same reader would appeal and so on um, when they make a, um, a traditional pitch. I'm not supposed to do that in the tweet pitch, but um, unless you're very efficient with the, with, with the old characters, but generally in pitching, I mean, do you think that conveying that sort of sense of where you think you sit in the, in the potential market for your book is beneficial? I think that's really helpful. Um, but I, I absolutely agree with what Louis says, that you need to have these current examples. You know, to say that your writing is like Jean Rhys, you know, that's a wonderful comparison. But, you know, she, you know, yeah, we need something like, you know, like Meg Mason, you know, the Sorrow and Bliss writer, um, uh, rather than something that would be seen to be, um, a, you know, a classic. I, yeah, I would also say that it's probably, I mean, this might be personal, but, but to me, those are sometimes the least important parts of the traditional submission, um, because in a way, I if the rest of the blurb and the pitch about the actual story and the writing are engaging and interesting, I'll be doing some of the work already of saying, oh, I can see this, I can sort of pitch this as the new Meg Mason or, you know, for, for fans of this and that. And some of that kind of pitching marketing element um, is for me to do uh, uh, as as your eventual agent. Um, so I think if you're if you're struggling to sort of figure out exactly who you would compare yourself to or if it doesn't quite feel like the right fit, I wouldn't I wouldn't sort of hold back on sending the letter um, until you found someone. Just sort of trust in the rest of your of your 
pitch and your own story and your own voice. Yeah, yeah. And what about kind of, I mean, this is, as, there's a whole ocean of possibilities in this, but what about the more, the more helpful don'ts? Okay, you know, I've, I've, I've encountered pitches that were made on um, kind of perspect, perspect, clear perspect roles were printed on that. You had to kind of hold up to the light. I've seen uh, one that was actually mostly an invisible ink and you, they sent you the stuff you had to put on it to, to see the, uh, 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 there's been CDs and all sorts of, you know, the accompanying music and all the rest of it. What about other kind of, you know, helpful don'ts here? What, where are we now with what you shouldn't do when you publish your, uh, when you pitch your work, you know, that might be a common, misconception that might be a practice that people do that really doesn't help at all don't trash other authors and titles um don't uh don't do down anything else that's already been published and position your work as better um because i think that is just an immediate red flag um to me of uh of how it might be to work with you basically <laughs> um but also um i think it's 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 a dangerous tactic to um employ tempting though it might be to say you know well if that rubbish got published then you know mine's going to breeze it um but it's dangerous because you just you just don't know what the relationships between the agent the editor and the author that you're trashing might be already and um so that is something that I see quite a lot in letters and I would advise against. But it's don't, a package. Yeah. Sorry, Jenny. Yeah. Sorry. It's no, I was going to say, sort. don't uh, send your email submission to countless agents on the same email so we can see exactly who else you've sent it to. Um, those, you, those emails of submissions usually get deleted by every single agent. So target your submission to each agent. I know it takes time, but it's going to be time well, very well spent. I would also say, if I think about don'ts, don't say my novel will make a terrific film and Nicole Kidman would be perfect for the leading role. <laughs> That's getting ahead of yourself. <laughs> yeah, I think I also it, it comes down to um, just trust the, the when I open a cover letter, the thing I'm most interested in is the blurb. Um, because I'm coming to your work like a reader, a prospective reader and customer in Waterstones, where I'll flip over a book to read the back of the book to see if that kind of hooks my interest, to see if that makes me want to commit to buying it and reading more. Um, and I open up cover letters with much the same frame of mind. I want to read a blurb that intrigues me, that you know promises me uh, an ex a storytelling experience that I'm kind of you know excited about. And the rest of the cover letter um, isn't isn't so kind of important to me. Um, you know, trust in the the blurb doing justice to the story that you're um, that you're putting forward, and, and don't I, and confuse the confuse the letter with lots of extraneous detail around that. Yeah, and I would say you know, writing a, a pitch or a description of a book. It's hard and time consuming. We do it all the time. It, it's meant to be hard. Otherwise, it, you know, it would be too easy to sell books. Um, but the thing that I do quite a lot is you go on your retailer of choice and uh, you read how books, how other books are described. And you do that a lot for a lot of books. Um, you'll see, you know, the way rom-coms are described, the way crime novels are described and non-fiction, um, I spend a lot of my time looking up synonyms to stop using yeah. moving. Poignant, bittersweet, touching. I know. Yeah. So I, you know, every word uh, on my pitch gets a synonym check. Is there a, you know, fancier word I could use? Is there one that is more striking? <laughs> is there a combination of words? Um, you know, I, I personally like to describe books with three adjectives, I like a good three, and they have to fit. And, you know, it's quite hard and you spend a lot of time, but that's, you know, it is challenging, but there is a lot of competition out there. The more time you spend on this, the more you will stand out because it is hard because there are 
so many books out there. So standing out um, and working on this and trying out, you know, especially if you have a pitch for a book and you're hesitating between two, two of them, just put them both on Expo North, see which one gets more traction. Yeah. And then this is probably the one you should use in your submission letters going forward, you know, see which one really stand out. I, I would. Yeah, exactly. As Caro said, like this is it's it's hard, but it's also a way of showing off your craft and care as a writer. Um, that's not just what the manuscript is doing. Your cover letter and particularly your blurb are a showcase for your skills as a writer in, um, you know, in in microcosm. Um, there's a book that I haven't read all of yet, but um, called Blurb Your Enthusiasm by Louise Wilder, who I think was a copywriter for Penguin Random House for decades. And it's all about the process of her kind of her work um, in creating the perfect pitches and blurbs for um, for a whole host of different kinds of um different kinds of genre of titles so that that might also be quite fun to to look at and yeah just as Kara said if I'm sending out um a detective novel I'll um sort of sit on Amazon for ages and look at lots of other um detective novel blurbs on Amazon and just sort of see what works what 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 are the elements what are the beats that I need um uh you know and just to get into the frame of mind um for for that particular kind of pitch so it's it that's a really good practice Jenny can I just ask you does is um the package that someone sends now I know you know the golden rule here is before you send anything read the guidelines on the agent or publisher's Absolutely. website mm -hmm. that's you know the fundamental golden rule is You've got to send what they ask for in the way they ask for it, because that has a purpose and it's necessary and you can't sidestep it. Um, mm. Having said that, just to generalise, does the submission kind of package, does that look the same as, or has that changed? I mean, you know, like a cover letter, um, a certain percentage of the work that people, you know, might specify on their website or on the whole thing or three chapters or three pages or whatever, a CV of some sort. You know, what, what, what is the, what, what, what should a writer be looking for in terms of preparation of a package for this? Process? I think uh, in, you know, the 20 years or odd that I've been working as an agent, it has changed because it's no longer pay on paper. It's no longer masses of jiffy bags arriving uh, every day um, with the, the you know, uh, first three chapters or whatever. It's it's email. And I think that almost every agent will uh, prefer to have an email submission now with attachments and watch out how the attachments come. Because, you know, for me, uh, I'd much rather have a word attachment or it, a PDF because what I do is those uh, I, I put them onto my Kindle and I want to be able to read them. And it's then some form, the Kindle doesn't. Uh, so I say that's what I want, um, but some uh, Kindle doesn't uh, automatically accept all formats of documents. And it's, you know, it's, it's not impossible. You just get back to the writer and say, please send again. But I should say, just watch out for that because I think a lot of agents and certainly very many publishers, that's the way they will first read your work um on a kindle or similar device um so yes email so of course it makes it very easy and very uh much more cost effective and environmentally much improved to to do email submissions but of course they are quick and i think sometimes for some writers it's it's too quick you just need to take, as, as both Karen and Louise have pointed out, that time to make sure it's as good as it can possibly be. Um, because remember, although we're all reading masses of submissions, we all come to each submission wanting to be excited. We want to find this is the most extraordinary work that we've ever come across, and we can't wait to read more. That's, that's our attitude, isn't it? Um, that's how we approach submissions uh so yeah sorry I'm, I'm trying to say in a circular kind of way take your time it may be it may be just so easy to press a button and send an email but make sure it's as good as it can possibly be work those synonyms i do exactly the same Karen. <laughs> i mean and the thing to bear in mind is that 
you know, the, the whole point of this, of the selling process to the agent, you know, in the way they want to receive it, the way they can read it, is because, of course, they are going to have to engage in the process of selling the work to a publisher. You know, they're going to represent you, and they've got to, if, if you can't excite the, you know, the agent, if you can't actually find something in your work that really appeals to them, then you've got to think about what was the process they're engaged in. You know, it's not a simple customness of mm. enjoying rejecting people. It's about how the industry works. And that's why these kinds of things exist and why it takes time and, you know, why it's not an instant kind of process, you know, very, very rarely so, you know. Um, so bear that in mind. What is the industry you're in, you're wanting to get into with this? You're asking someone to represent your work and you've got to be able to enthuse them about that and to inform them about it. Because otherwise it ain't going to go anywhere beyond that. And that is not what you want, you know. Um, so just returning, I'm aware of time. Uh, we're, uh, we're a little bit over the advertised uh, schedule, but just returning finally to some, some questions here. Um, let me just have a look. Um, with regards to being unpublished, um, does this mean unpublished outright or not yet published acquired with the traditional publisher and i suppose also about self-published works if you're self-published you know how, how do we feel about that in relationship to the to the tweet pitch um so it, it if the question is um you know does it change things when you're pitching either through expo or, or traditional channels is it different if you've already self-published a title um, I think um, I think the issue there for me, regardless of whether the pitch is coming from Expo or if it were coming through my usual submissions channel, um, if you've already self-published a title, it makes it a much a very different proposition for me to then take that same title to a publisher um, because or a traditional publisher because if you've self-published and it hasn't you know changed the world, um, but it has been out there it has had some sort of some take up um it 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 can just sometimes be a little bit trickier for a publisher to think you know we haven't got a completely clean slate with this book um it's already had a bit of a life um so this is maybe not the easiest book to launch as a fresh debut um so i think if you are um considering whether to submit or pitch uh, to agents um, and you don't know whether it's worth trying self-publishing first, I think I would always recommend try the traditional channels first because once you start self-publishing those titles, you're just making things a little bit trickier for yourself, but that's that's kind of on, on sort of the, the YA side of things for me. Yeah, can I just say as well that there was a um, last uh, June, July uh, expo, we put together a really interesting uh, panel like this, which was all about the relationship between agents and self-published work and the way in which that's working, the way in which other rights are being developed and the kinds of things that agents are working in that kind of, you know, cross-sectoral sort of way are actually working and what they're doing. And that video is available on uh, the Expo North YouTube page. Um, you could search Expo North John Gerald, the great agent John Gerald was one of them um, and one of the participants and it's full of really interesting information and I would actually go as far as to say that I, you know I, I, I think look at that first before getting involved in the tweet pitch because I think it's just going to be kind of quite confusing and again you don't want to get involved in something that is just going to be frustrating and a rejection down the line and all the rest of it you know it's a different thing in a way. Um, it's a really growing area of interest, I think, in how all these kind of hybrid things are working, what they're going to be working like and so on in the future. And we've covered that in great detail just, um, you know, six months ago. So look out for that, I'd say, before deciding whether to come into this, because you, you might want to take a different approach. And you've also got to be, I think, quite rights aware in terms of when you've self-published a work, what you're actually asking an agent to do. It's not simply a matter of telling the story that's part of it. You know, what rights are you asking them to represent? What are you asking them to do in relationship to you? Um, and they're very specific things, but they're different 
from this process i think so I'd, again i'll just caution you know um there is no you know we don't have a a, a gate on twitter you know people can use the hashtag expo north and be a part of it but again you know you don't want to be involved in something that m creates an unnecessary feeling of rejection or lack of engagement and that wouldn't be accurate anyway you know you just might be in the right in the wrong place at the wrong time for you, for your work in doing something like this so look at those kind of things resources that are online as well um uh there's some uh, very long questions here um which i'll have a look at afterwards um uh, I'm answering some of them uh, by writing answers by the way uh for yeah. all the ones that i can answer is just so we can get Thank through you. all of them <laughs> yeah um will there be a, a recording you can see a recording of this later yes it'll take, take a little while to be on on youtube it'll be an expo north youtube um page um so this video will be there. Um, uh, so uh, someone asking, can you do tweet pitch with Expo North if your other titles are out with a traditional publisher? So work that might already be being marketed. How do we feel about that? What uh, like a promotion rather than a pitch? Well, no, I think it's probably, I think what they're referring to is where there's a situation that somebody has already sent work out and it might be you know they've sent it out to an agent or a publisher can they additionally send that to expo north to the tweet pitch you know yeah yeah i don't see why not um yeah quite a few questions here about how twitter works really other than agents and publishers will other tweeters be able to see the submitted pitches yes they will and um uh, last year we broke um, the tweet pitch using the hashtag Expo North um, trended in the top four on Twitter in the UK for about eight hours and there were over a million views of uh, that hashtag in that day so yep this is not a place uh, of shadows I'm afraid your work will be available to everyone who goes onto Twitter and, and engages with that hashtag or not who just comes across it your followers and your all the rest of it will be able to see your work um so be aware of that it's not a private process and um, peach you would just say that it's one of the glorious things about the tweet pitch is the reaction that we get from fellow new writers uh to the pitches so please feel free to respond to when you see a pitch that you really like just say that sounds fantastic you know can't wait to read this good luck with it or whatever um, because there's a generosity, a real community spirit about this day. And that's just one of the things I love about it, as well as finding, you know, new work. Yeah, absolutely. Let's uh, let's let's take back a bit of Twitter for, yeah. for, for one day, shall we, and be uh, supportive about each other. And that's this industry anyway, you know, no matter how difficult it is, you know, it's great to be able to support um, writing and publishing and the whole industry in Scotland. Number of questions here about, is there a market for this? Is there a market for that? I'm going to summarise by that saying, well, this is your chance to find out. You know, you've got to sell that um you know we can't answer every question about is this particular thing a subject that people or agents are interested in well they might not know actually it depends on what it is and how you pitch it as well and what the uh you know may, maybe you're doing something new and maybe you've got to open the market who knows it's, it's um, always worth pitching yeah. the worst thing that can happen is that people don't request it that's it there's no other negatives um so, well, that said, um, thanks so much to uh, Jenny, Louise and Caro and um, good luck to everyone taking part in the tweet pitch, which is on the 20th of January with the hashtag X-P-O-N-O-R-T-H, those letters, Expo North. And um, it's my job now just to thank everyone and to hand back to, to, to Claire. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. Oh, thanks so much, Peter. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us today. What a huge turnout we had. Um, and a big, huge thank you um, to our panellists and speakers. Um, I find that so interesting. So I hope everyone else did as well. Um, I don't know about anyone else, but I've got my list of 
um, novels that I'm going to explore and I've added to my reading list so um, I'm away to look, look, look at those now so thank you so much um, just on behalf of Expo North Digital yeah huge thanks for joining us today um, to stay up to date with Expo North Digital please make sure that you sign up to our newsletter so that you're the first to hear about all our events happening like us on all our socials and follow us on those um, and we also can't wait to um, to read and see all those um, tweet pitches coming in um, next week as well. Um, I'm just going to pop a link to a feedback survey in the chat. Um, it would be great if you've got come and spare a couple of minutes. There's five questions on there. Um, and take some time and um, complete that for us. That would be great. We'll also um, follow up. Um, post event um, with an email with the link to the survey as well and um, but if you could complete that for us that would be great and um, that's all from us thanks so much to everyone for joining and have a great evening everyone thank you thank you so much